A lot of naval ship development is somewhat cyclical, with a craft coming into being, gradually growing in size as new or improved capabilities are added to it, and then when it has become something so large that its connection with its original design role is usually only tangential, someone tends to reinvent the original idea in some form in what's now a smaller and cheaper package. Such was the case with torpedo attack craft. When first deployed in the late 19th century, torpedo boats were, at least for their time, fast and quite small, displacing only double-digit tons. Over time, these would grow until eventually their lineage could be traced by the first half of the 20th century onwards to the fleet destroyer. Although small for a full-scale warship, the destroyer would now displace hundreds and later thousands of tons, was armed with multiple torpedo launchers, various heavy guns, and other weapons. As a result, the small, fast, primarily torpedo-armed attack craft would resurface in World War I with vessels like the British Coastal Motorboat, and as war clouds gathered in the late 1930s, the US Navy dusted off some ideas it had been presented with during and shortly after World War I that followed a similar line. These would eventually become the PT, or Patrol Torpedo, boats. Initially, the US Navy was looking for a larger and a smaller design, both capable of launching at least two torpedoes and otherwise to be armed with a couple of 50 cal machine guns and maybe a few depth charges. The main difference was to be operational range, and with that the saved weight would mean the lighter model could be moved en masse by motherships, whilst the larger version would either be moved in smaller numbers or more likely need to be towed. A few of the winners of both size categories were to be built, and the larger one coming in at 81 foot long in the end, whilst the former was about 58 foot long. These were then used as experimental units to refine the armament layout and usage, as well as to assess the design's effectiveness. They were then supplemented by a range of craft coming from private, navy and overseas designs, which included PT-9, which was actually a British-designed motor torpedo boat that had been rebadged. A series of tests would then take place over 1939, 1940 and 1941, with maximum armament having risen to four torpedoes, and the tests looked primarily at speed, agility, durability, and how much each type experienced pounding as they surged through the waves, which was a serious marker of both long-term durability and crew comfort, which directly translated into performance, as most men don't tend to manage high-stress situations all that well if they've just spent several hours being thrown violently all over the place. Despite many referring to PT boats as Elcos, or Elco boats, after the short form of the Electric Launch Company, which was a firm formed specifically to compete for these contracts, the initial results of the Elco designs in these competitions weren't actually that good. It was found that they were relatively weakly built and liable to damage themselves, especially since they tended to pound very heavily. A 72-foot design by the Huckins Yacht Corporation and a 78-foot version by the Higgins Industries were instead ordered for the larger boat design, which became the most common, and these would become the first major classes of PT boat built. However, Elko would have a bit of a last-minute comeback as they returned with a much improved 80-foot design, which would eventually become the single largest overall group of PT boats built once the war began, accounting for 326 of the 531 PT boats that would serve during World War II. Displacing somewhere between the mid-40s and high-50s of tons, depending on the exact type of boat and how heavily loaded it was, most PT boats could make around 40 knots, give or take a knot or two, and would carry four torpedoes. Initially, these were Mark 8 models in the somewhat confusingly named Mark 18 torpedo launcher, which didn't actually launch Mark 18 torpedoes. Those were generally used by submarines in the latter stages of World War II. Later on, this whole assembly was replaced by four roll-off racks for specially adapted Mark 13 aerial torpedoes, and this meant that in night actions there was no longer a flash on torpedo launch. The older launchers used a gunpowder charge to propel their contents away, and either the flash or the continuous burning of this charge could sometimes give away the location of the PT boat in question. Other armament was, at least nominally, a pair of Browning 50 caliber machine guns, 
But as the war went on, a series of official experimental armament additions, as well as the crews increasingly just outright stealing anything that would fit and that they could carry, would see mid to late war PT boats armed with a bewildering array of weapons, which could include, but was not limited entirely to, smaller machine guns such as Lewis guns and Browning 30 cals, additional Browning 50 cals, 20mm Orlicans, 40mm Bofors, 37mm anti-tank cannons, and 37mm automatic cannons originally taken from a crashed Aero Cobra. There were also 5-inch rocket launchers, sea mines, anti-submarine depth charges, and most would also carry small smoke generators or at least smoke floats, which they could use to disguise themselves. Although designed to target high-value warships, actual deployment experience showed that this wasn't actually the PT boat's normal strength. The glow of marine life in their normal domain of the Western Pacific, when they were moving at high speed and it was all churned up in their wakes, combined with their relative fragility and flammability, since they ran on gasoline engines, meant that an alert destroyer or cruiser crew could normally make quite short work of incoming PT boats, as long as the larger ships weren't distracted by still larger threats. Although the small craft would claim a few kills in this area. Instead, the PT boats actually proved to be most effective at covert reconnaissance, patrols, and what we today would call special forces missions, as well as targeting less well-defended Japanese supply barges and transport convoys and in these situations, even reports of their presence could often cause delays, disruptions, and aborted sailings, even if the PT boats never fired a shot in anger. In the European environment, they also did relatively well against German Schnellböter, even though this was an environment where the PT boats were usually the smallest of the combatants, as both the Schnellböter and the British motor torpedo and motor gunboats were usually substantially larger but the British craft, whilst by far the most heavily armed in most cases, were also the slowest, whereas the PT boats were more capable of keeping pace with their German counterparts, whilst still retaining something of a firepower advantage, as most Schnellböter tended to mount only 20mm cannons, and maybe occasionally a 37mm. All told, 99 PT boats would be lost to enemy action, although more than half of these were down to the environment scuttling in the early part of the war, or friendly fire. 31 were sunk by direct enemy action, and another 9 by mines, although this doesn't include numerous craft that were damaged. Due to their nature as small, short-range attack craft made of wood, which would require constant maintenance, almost all of them were very quickly disposed of in the late 1940s at the end of World War II. But, thanks to their relatively small size, low cost, and uh, frankly sheer numbers compared to most larger warships, quite a few survived in private hands in various forms. Although time and tide has taken a number more over the years, there are still almost 20 hulls in existence, most of them in the US, and a handful of others overseas. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.